Let me offer you a quick quiz here. We'll just come back to the ideas associated with uh, signal to noise ratio. And pose a uh, problem. Let's say you went out and you collected a 20 fold data set. And uh, you didn't quite get the signal to noise, you know, the improvements in signal to noise ratio that you wanted. So you'd like to go back and recollect your data or get additional data which would increase your signal to noise ratio by a factor of two, the question would be what fold data would be required for you to obtain a two-fold increase in your uh, signal to noise ratio. So take a moment, uh, pause the video you know, if you want to tackle the problem and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you back on the other side. So the problem is could be set up in a, in a couple different ways, but uh, let's take a look at it from this perspective here. The signal to noise ratio, just by definition, is the is n the number of traces over the square root of n, and we know that uh, you know just just working through the algebra here that uh, we get the signal to noise ratio is uh, equal to the square root of the the uh, number of da da number of traces that you've uh, collected. So, so we have this basic relationship here, and the current signal to noise ratio is going to be equal to the square root of n relative to a, and this would be relative to a single trace. So, if you only collected one trace, now that you have 20 traces, you've increased your signal to noise ratio over a single fold data set. Uh, to 4.472 times its uh, original signal to noise ratio and that could be could have been pretty bad it could have been okay but uh, you could you collected what you thought would be enough traces in order to improve your signal to noise ratio that's probably an odd number you might not have set out in advance to improve your signal to noise ratio by 4.472 but 20 is a nice round number so but this would be the uh, signal-to-noise ratio improvement that you get for uh, this 20-fold data set. Now, the new signal-to-noise ratio is going to be, you want it to be, twice the old. So we have 2 times the square root of 20. Remember, square root of 20 is just the signal-to-noise -to ratio here. So we have 2 times 4.472. That gives us 8.944. We know that's the square root of the number of traces that we would need in order to improve our signal to noise ratio by a factor of 2. So that gives us an n equal to 80. We'd actually have to collect four times as many traces in order to, to double the signal to noise ratio. So there, uh, another approach would be just to you know write this down as a signal to noise the new signal to noise ratio would be equal to the square root of the new number of traces that you need. That would be equal to 2 times the old number of traces. We take that 2 inside the radical here, we get 4 times the old. So we get that the number of new traces again is 4 times the old number of traces would be uh, 80. So if we wanted to have a fourfold increase, what would we need? Well, we would actually need um, 16 times uh, the number of traces that we had, which would be um, three, about 320 or so. So you can see you have to collect uh, a lot of data, a lot of additional data in order to get a, uh, a doubling of your signal to noise ratio. So it doesn't come without a certain cost in terms of labor. And uh, if 20 was good, then you, you probably want to, wanted to have, uh, may have wanted to stick with that. Now another problem here is that we've talked about the source-receiver combinations that provide information from a common midpoint. We looked at off-end shot data, and um, we did it for six receivers and, and 12 receivers. And uh, we uh, came up with... Um, uh, the source receiver combinations that we would need in order to uh, the groupings that we would need to to get uh, receivers that had recorded information from the same midpoint. So here we have a split spread 
uh, source receiver combination. So we have six receivers on one side, another six receivers on the other. We're just numbering the receivers by their number from left to right, 1 through 12. We've got a we've got a layer that's h thick, has a velocity v1, a velocity v2 in the underlying layer. And uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to move the source uh, like we did with the off-end uh, source receiver combinations. We're just going to move the source a distance equal to the geophone separation. And we'll just go from left to right here. And then we're going to number our um, reflection points just by the receiver number. So we have uh, reflection points 1, 2, 3, 4 through 12. We move the source, uh, distance equal to the receiver separation. Uh, we get additional recording reflection points, 1, 2, through 12. And you can see that we were beginning to get a superposition here of um, reflection events. So with that set up there, why don't you again pause the, uh, pause the video, uh, sit down and figure out what the what the receiver combinations are going to be. Are they going to be all the odd ones? Are they going to be all the even ones? Uh, which receiver combinations are going to give you information from a common midpoint? This point, this point, this point. Whatever midpoint it is that you happen to be looking at. So take a moment to do that. And um, welcome back. We move our source. Uh, we get these reflection points. We keep going with our source, and I'm not showing the repeated location of the source here. We're just moving it uh, further and further to the right. And you can see that we're beginning to build up a um, set of receiver combinations here, which provide information from particular reflection points or Fresnel zone scale regions on the reflector surface. Keep going with our source over to the left. And I think you can begin to see that, well, it doesn't work out like it did before with the off-end uh, source receiver combinations. We don't get um, all the even numbered receivers. Here we have uh, three odd, three even. Over here we have three even combined with three odd. And that's because we have this gap in here. And that gap effectively gives us an offset of one so that we do end up with um, odd number odd number and even number combinations there because of the presence of the gap and uh, again we just keep on going and you can see that this repetition continues 11 9 7 6 4 2 12 10 8 5 3 1 and uh, so on and these would be the basic combinations of receivers that are going to be giving you information from a common midpoint. And um, so if you were sorting your data, you wanted to go through the, wanted to collect all your data into common midpoint data, then go through the uh, NMO correction and the stacking process. Uh, then you'd be looking to collect the records that were recorded on a on receivers 11, 9, 7, 6, 4, and 2, and uh, records uh, recorded on receivers 12, 10, 8, 5, 3, and 1. So we have those uh, basic combinations here, and uh, hopefully that was a you know, fairly straightforward problem. It just, sh it just shows you that um, if you're going to be working with data, uh, the data that you do collect is is going to um, be binned in different ways. It's, you're going to have different receiver uh, combinations that, that you'll be uh, looking for. So we'll uh, keep this one fairly short. This was just uh, another six-fold data set, but with a different uh, with different receiver uh, combinations at the midpoints. And uh, the next time we're going to talk about uh, how the geometry of the NMO corrected and uh, summed data, or the stack trace, uh, what it actually represents. What, what effectively, geometrically, have we accomplished by 
uh, NMO correcting, all of the records that provide information from a common midpoint. And uh, so uh, thanks, uh, thanks again for joining us and uh, hope to see you next time.